Hey, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Angular Air. I am your host, Justin. And on today's episode, we are going to be checking out web API, some native web APIs, and some RxJS. So always exciting to get some RxJS love in there and uh, applying it to some, some native DOM stuff. It's going to be awesome. So can't wait for it. Let's say hi to our panelists, and then we'll meet our guests, and then we'll get into our content. Joining us today, we've got Mike. Mike, what's going on? I had double Justin happening because I've got the YouTube chats open and then I got you in here. You got to mute that site. You got to mute that double, site, son. <laughs> I had double Justin and it was good. I liked it, but I, I was confused. I, I'm not complaining about double Justin. So I'm good. I'm here. I'm ready. All right. Let's do some happy. Right. So, so hi, Mike. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Single Justin. Listen, hi, I, I, can I can handle that. All right. Perfect. Alyssa's with us. Alyssa, what's going on? Hi. <laughs> you know, but, all right. I hope I didn't scare you into not saying more than hi. You're more than welcome to say more than hi, please. No, no, it was Mike. Mike scared me. Double Justin. I, I don't know. All right. There you go. And our, our guest today is joining us once again. I think you were on a little over a year ago talking about some RxJS stuff. So we're very excited to have you back. John, how's it going? Yeah, it's pretty going. It's going pretty good. Damn, words are hard. Where it's a very difficult. <laughs> oh, this language stuff is so overrated. I know. Yes, it, it, it's really great to be back. Nice. We're stoked to have you back. Hey, do you want to uh, fill our viewers in a little bit about yourself? What you got going on? Uh, sure. Yeah. So my name is Niklas Wortmann. I'm usually from Germany, right now in Kansas City, um, enjoying the barbecue here. That's actually the only reason I'm here. Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were actually bonding barbecue. over Betty Ray's. So if you're in the Kansas City area, you got to get some Betty Ray's. <laughs> and Jack Stack. Jack Stack. Jack Stack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. New topic. Forget RxJS. Forget Web, Web API. Let's just do barbecue. Yeah. Okay. I, I could in, actually in. run down like the barbecue places and we could. Okay. So spare ribs at Jack Stack. Oh, spare ribs. I haven't had that. I'm actually writing this down right now. Keep going. And, uh, Burned end are always great. I never had bad burned end somewhere. And brisket at Q39. Mm, Q39 has some interesting personal highlights. Appetizers. I would I would recommend. They've got like, what was it? I was dunking some meatball thing in syrup. It was amazing. I can't remember what it was called. But I, it was incredible. So they had an apple coleslaw, and I was like, oh, that's magical. I want this. <laughs> I'm a PA, and all we get is coleslaw and french fries on sandwiches so pa that's you know i always I'll get confused. Pittsburgh. I'll Pittsburgh. i tell people you're from kentucky i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i literally I, don't know where P pennsylvania is like i don't north okay uh, <laughs> i i think mike okay. said you were from oklahoma I, last episode. He did. He right? did. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get political here I'm gonna get political. Yeah, I'm here. I'm from you. the state that kept on going red, blue, red, blue, <laughs> red, blue. <laughs> oh, okay, I, Mike. For me, if the, America is a triangle, like roughly that shape fits yeah. kind of well. Oh, Where's Pennsylvania? Work so well for me, yeah. Upper right quadrant. Oh, okay. So you're by okay, Florida. So it's, not, so it's not that far uh, away from Kansas right? City, like a little bit more in the north region. I don't know where Kansas City is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if we're a triangle, where where my nose is? Mm, 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 mm. See, yeah, I was more very... rhombus. <laughs> Justin, if you could like just like one more minute, I know we're off topic. I have something <laughs> to say that's gonna upset millions of people watching. I'm this. Mute myself. <laughs> what, that, why can't leave with that? What am I supposed to say? Oh, sure, go for it. <laughs> I lived in Orlando, Florida for nine years, and I moved here to Kansas City to be close to my sister, and everyone raves about the barbecue. I got to tell you, Orlando has better. And it's going to upset the people. I know it's going to upset the people, but the food and the like culture combinations that I found in Orlando, it was just like on fire. Here, I'm like, there's some meat on a plate. I don't know. <laughs> send her, to the, send her to the green room. Get her out of here. <laughs> what else do you want? Like meat, plate, maybe smoke and barbecue want, sauce. That's I all want you need. Fusion <laughs> and flavor. I want to feel like I've never tasted food before this moment, right? Like. <laughs> so it's like 9 a.m. here. Is it too early for brisket? I mean, I, no. I think I feel like. 
No, not too nope, early. It's All never right. too early for brisket. Oh god. Is it an eggs? Ooh. Yeah, a brisket omelet. Yeah. All right. So you guys got the show from here. I'm gonna go eat. <laughs> yeah, we're we're good. We're good. Right. We got this. Oh my goodness. So okay. Web APIs? Yes. Um, uh a g- g- good uh, topic switch. Okay, I think to make the transition from here on, we can have a look at my slides because okay. as a consultant, I'm always prepared and have slides ready. <laughs> um, nice. Right. Th- that's actually my, the only job I do. I prepare slides and then I see, oh, I have this meeting. I need to pull up these slides. Here you go. That's all I do. Um, go. Okay. Uh, RxS Web is a library making of wrapping web APIs with observables. And I actually had the idea based on this statement. RxS technically is a library for composing asynchronous and event-based programs by using observable sequence. It's like pretty much the first sentence in our docs page. And I know when I saw this, I was like, wait, we have those web APIs. And we have this library, which is good for the web. But web APIs and their total ergonomy just is not very comfortable um, to try to express it politely. Um, and before we dive deep into that, I due to barbecue, I completely missed my introduction properly. So I'm a consultant. I'm part of the RxS core team. And I'm Angular GD. That's all I got, pretty much. OK, back to web APIs. So for web APIs, just to give a quick recap, it's provided by the browser. So the browser provides a certain API that we can use then. And this is fundamentally different from APIs that are, for example, provided by the V8 engine. Because the V8 engine implements the ECMAScript standard, uh, more or less. Therefore, you have everything that is defined in the ECMAScript standard available in common browsers and Node.js, for example. I am using Chrome only. That's why wrote Chrome here, but in browsers, it's a little bit different as they can add their own APIs that are not part of the ECMAScript standard. And one very common example for that is, for example, the event listener API, right? You have add event listener, that's part of the web API and not part of the uh, V8 engine. And actually, the whole DOM itself is part of the web API, of, is a web API by definition. But when I look at MDN, there are Plenty of web APIs, like literally plenty. And this is super great because they can um, provide a very immersive and feature-rich web application, it can make your experience as user much more native in the end also. So for example, Google Maps is fancy-fancy based on the geolocation API. That's at least what I use Google Maps most of the time for. It's like, I'm here. How do I get somewhere else? And this is all implemented on this um, on this geolocation API that tells the browser where I am right now. Also, progressive web apps heavily use those web APIs. As the Twitter is, from my point of view, or it's at least the PWA that I use the most often. And they have so many web APIs integrated into that. They have a vibration API integrated. They have geolocation integrated. They have service worker integrated and so on and so forth. And this is just the stuff I know by using that app, not even without having knowledge about the code base. So there are really cool applications out there that are already using web APIs a lot. But when you're using web APIs, it feels good in the beginning. You're making progress. It's, it's, it's feeling good. But you soon notice that web APIs have certain design flaws. And I broke this down a little bit. It's, it's a little bit easy. I have to admit it. It might it's a little bit more complex in reality, but to break it down a little bit, if a web API returns a single value, it's usually a promise. So, for example, if you want to get the current geolocation position, you will get this information as a promise. If the API provides multiple values, it's usually a callback. So, for example, there's also watch position, which in a calls that callback function every time the geolocation changes. And here are some of the problems with promises and callbacks. For example, promises are always asynchronous. And I have to be aware of that information that they always are asynchronous and also eager, which 
trick some people very often. So actually, every time I work with Promise, I'm I'm feeling like a toddler and like, I don't know what I need to do. I don't want this. Um, and when I started work, uh, developing, actually, callbacks were their big thing. And we moved away from that because callback hell and it's kind of weird and difficult to read and uh, ugly to compose. Both of those approaches kind of lack cancellation, at least from a consumer point of view, you can't tell, okay, I don't want to be notified anymore. You can do weird stuff with callbacks, like if listening, do stuff, if not, don't execute this function, but the function is still called and you will see it in your call stack. For promises, it's getting better with cancellation due to a board controller, but it's still not a widely supported API, at least from a library point of view. Yeah, and I already mentioned it. Both of those approaches are terrible to compose. If you say, okay, I want to watch position and then I want to trigger a vibration and then I want to do something else, this is just terrible and leads to nesting and bad things happen. This is some code that I wrote a while ago to implement drag and drop with web APIs in a normal approach. And you already see some of the problems that I faced due to missing composition. So I'm just basically using the event listener API and I had to pass function reference, which I usually try to prevent as this might trick you. As you see here, bind this, I'm, I, I do Angular, I don't want to deal with this, right? So like in Angular, you usually don't do bind this, this is just not a thing. So um, colleagues of mine would feel the same way about this code, like why are you doing this? And then they have to dig into that. And it's, it's, it's just weird and seems unnecessary. And the worst thing actually in the end is I don't have a unified interface, I don't have one single approach, how I can deal with all those different web APIs. And Ben once said in one, on, on a, one of his recent blog posts, which is actually amazing, um, that observables are a unified API that can represent a wide variety of things. So I thought like, let's do this. Let's make um, web APIs less shitty. And here we go with RxJS web. So it's when you set out to unify the API, mm -hmm. uh, were you was it a single use case where you said, all right, I need this one API um, and then I'm going to implement that and then it branched out? Or was it this grandiose task of saying, hey, there's all these things out here. I want to do all of them. And it started actually with mutation observer because I had the idea last year at RxJS Live, like this thingy. Uh, mm -hmm. That mutation observer, I mean, they already have observer in its name, so it seems kind of reactive. And actually, you can build really cool stuff with the mutation observer API. Um, for example, my idea was to implement a loading skeleton with that, where you can trigger um, some kind of data fetching. And while you're doing this data fetching with the mutation observer, start a skeleton. And this is also one of the examples that I later want to show. But this was the starting point that I said, like, okay, mutation observer were kind of cool. Um, and then Matt uh, Potwizaki started like, oh, yeah, we had this in RxS4, but it was, uh, we just didn't port it over to RxS5. So I was like, okay, we should, we, should, we should do something about that. And from there on, I was like, oh, yeah, this could also be cool. And oh, yeah, oh, oh. And yeah, here we are again now. <laughs> It's that shiny effect, right? Yeah, yeah shiny. It's, it's really like, <laughs> you're on, the, on the left side, you have the shitty test that you know I should really write test. Oh, yes, this new shiny API. I do this. Um, and my idea for RHS Web in the end was also not just to wrap uh, the shitty Web API. Shitty is such a hard word, but the less convenient web API in an observable, go, because then you still have the eagerness of the promises, for example, which every time trips me. So what I wanted was a observable, blah, 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 an observable wrapper that behaves like observables, but with web APIs. And it's, it is an alpha. I'm still procrastinating to write tests. So this is pretty much the only thing missing. And, and that's, that's a requirement. 
I would, I personally would feel better to release a stable <laughs> version with a proper test coverage. I'm just, I'm just ribbing. I'm just ribbing. I know I'm making some people twitch in the community Fair. right now. So you're welcome. Um, yeah. So, uh, quick call to action. If you're interested in that stuff, uh, use that for some proof of concept, maybe try it out in your application. And if you find it useful, just let me know. Uh, or particularly if you find bugs, that would be super cool. I quickly want to talk about some of the use cases that I thought about. And um, another one besides Twitter, uh, Twitter is actually a weather app, right? So I barely look up the weather at a different location that I am right now. I usually look up, okay, where's how's the weather right here when I'm too lazy to just go out this very moment? Or how's the weather tomorrow at my location? Same, right? No, I have a question. <laughs> but yes, yes, absolutely the same. Because I don't care what uh, Alyssa's weather is like right now. I really don't. <clears throat> and windows can be inconvenient to look out of. So yeah, True. Your phone with a loca location is great. But, but I wanted to be clear. So you mentioned the NPM install of the ArcJS dash web. Um, so the only dependency I'm assuming we're looking at is RxJS. So it's yes. So RxJS right now has a dependency to TSLIP, if I remember correctly. So this one comes as well. That's fine. Um, yeah, but besides that, it's um, dependency less, which is also one of the gotchas as I'm not providing any kind of polyfills or something like that. That's fair. Uh, no, the reason I'm asking is <clears throat> the name of our show is Angular Air. So nothing that we're looking at is necessarily Angular specific. It's RxJS, which is a large part of Angular, but it's not necessarily specific to Angular. Absolutely. Okay. You can I didn't really clarify uh, that for myself and anybody who's watching. No, that's a very good question, actually. Um, so the thing is, it's dependency less, more or less. So you can, you're actually, you should use it everywhere where you want it, um, as long as you feel comfortable with RxJS. I want to turn things into an observable, but I don't like observables. So quite a, quite the conundrum that you can get yourself into. <laughs> To be fair, so I saw many people that doing that are doing Angular think like, oh, I have to do everything with observables just because it is a dependency. But like, if you just look at the Angular APIs, you barely have to use observables. So you could implement your own HTTP client fully based on Axios. You could use uh, guards and activated route snapshot to prevent uh, or to mitigate the observables from the router. And you can use template-driven forms so you don't really have to use observables. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Quick. Uh, yeah. No, we're, that, no, we're good. <laughs> Weather app. Weather app. So I prepared this tiny StackBlitz example, but StackBlitz is always trolling me with their geolocation integration, so I'm not showing it because I'm like it's 50-50 working. And it's definitely not part of RxJS Web. I just want to make this clear. The ticket is opened at Stackless. <laughs> um, but in this demo, you already saw, even though it's a little bit choppy, uh, you see that when I change the geolocation with the sensor API provided by, or the sensor mock API provided by Chrome, that the weather at this very location is immediately changed. And this is due to RxJS Web. Surprise, surprise. The code for this looks more or less like that. So we start here with from position. Pretty much everything provided by RxJS Web is instant or like prefix with from something something. So if you want to have the position API, it's from position. And this will return you the geolocation object, which you can then use, for example, to call an API that gives you the city for that. GPS coordinates, and you can then use that to render it. The cool thing about this is that it's already supports automatic updates, like it wraps watch position so that is given. It also supports cancellation, which is usually not given by promises. Um, wrapped in that to make it a little bit more convenient is also the permission request, because for the uh, geolocation API, you have to ask the user to grant you permissions. And if the user denies that, it will throw an error so that you can then use RHS mechanisms like catch error, repeat, 
retry when uh, or whatever to handle that appropriately. And the example that I showed here does not handle error cases. I just want to make that clear. It's not magically hidden or something. It will throw all the errors. Uh, I was just too lazy to implement it in the example because I'm lazy. You can check this out afterwards on this uh, Stackblitz link. I will ask Justin to put it in the notes somewhere. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, I already teased this tiny example, and this is the mutation observer example that I meant, where I'm showing this loading skeleton based on elements that I want to render. So Slack, for example, is doing that during their loading processes that they show these gray elements. And this is all the CSS skills I have, so I put a lot of love in that um, to get this animation. I suck so bad at CSS. <laughs> I look good. I like it. Right? Uh, we should be friends because <laughs> like you're really good at all the stuff i don't like <laughs> kind of hurt. i'll do wait, all, your, wait, wait. all your css <laughs> john meet Alyssa. Alyssa, meet john now you're friends <laughs> easy so that's how this is working interesting um mutation observer api so this is the example that I have prepared, and I can increase the font a little bit. So in this example, I'm assuming I want to render a certain amount of elements. So I'm already predicting this information. Um, but what I, do, uh, what I do then is I created those three list items. I trigger the animation by adding a class, doing the load. And because Stackblitz is using service worker, they cache everything, so I added a Synthetic old delay just to make it visible. And by removing that class, the animation is gone. That's how apparently how CSS work. I was not aware of that. But, um, and this was, I still think it requires a lot of RxS knowledge to like be aware that you have, for example, to subscribe first to the mutation observer before you add those elements just because it's lazy and you will get notified afterwards. You have to be aware of things like, OK, merge map does some kind of spread mechanisms if you pass an array to that, uh, and stuff like that. So it requires heavy knowledge about RHS. But if you have that knowledge, you don't have to deal with all the weird things that web APIs have. So it's like kind of a little bit of a trade off what you invest your time. Um, I think another, another point there that uh, is positive, though, is that it does then allow you to work in the RxJS space, right? So you have the example of your delay there to to simulate something with the caching, but you could also say like, look, if I if I wanted to have a UX that showed a loading to indicate and give the customer a feel that that something's happening, and you know that that call happens really fast, but you want to delay it for like a couple seconds, you know, for that experience, sure. and you say, well, if I'm using RxJS, I could throw a delay in there, and boom, I've I've got that logic working right. So. It, it also opens the gate that you can solve other things by using your RxJS skills and experience. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. And biggest benefit for me is always I don't have to deal with promises. <laughs> um, one quick question while I'm looking at this sure. that um, you may be talking about later on, but you may not. Uh, Probably what, are not. The type, what do the types look like uh, from this? So. So this is one of the things that I have to figure out because some of the things are already providing really good types if okay. you're uh, by TypeScript. The network API, for example, does not provide good API, uh, good types so far. So there are some, um, some gotchas. Um, but usually, so mutation observer, for example, does provide natively with types TSLib um, good typings. Uh, good question. I yeah, but testing is still a pain in the ass if you're using that just because you're relying on native web APIs. It's yeah, I'm not going to talk that nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so the last example that I've prepared is what I call dynamic fetching. And again, I'm a consultant, so I prepared this highly sophisticated diagram here, and. What I do is, in the beginning, I check the network condition. If I have a good connection, then I load many items because I can. I know the internet connection of the user will be fast enough to render those in appropriate time. 
if I have a bad connection, I still want to render some items just that the user see something. So imagine like a news app or whatever. So if the user has bad network connection, you can render like the latest two news entries so that he can still interact with the app and see something and be happy about it. Uh, but if you have a good connection, you just load everything what the internet provides. And the code for that is, besides the thing that the typing sucks, what I already mentioned, is fairly easy. So you have the from network request. And network also provides, the network API, the web API provides a way to watch network changes. So that's what, uh, what is provided here with from network. And you can just use first to get the latest value with that. Um, and by using switch map, then you're then starting your HTTP call by using the from fetch that is provided by RxJS. And that's all the tricks. So we're checking here if we have a net, uh, network connection of like 2G, we could also make it more reliable with like um, actual bandwidths, house downstream and stuff like that. It's also provided by the network API. Anyway, then you're just loading some elements. If you have good connection, load more. Stuff like that for sure has to be provided, like some kind of pagination by your API, kind of given here. But still a cool uh, use case. And I'm actually in the project that I'm working in right now. So I joined late. Otherwise, I would probably use exactly this. Um, but they implemented something fairly different, uh, sound, fairly similar. Damn, words. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, you can always blame it. It's early, right? It, well, maybe it's not early where you're at. But it's early where I'm at, so you can say it's I, early. I had to get up early because I'm mostly working with German and Indian colleagues, so seven hours ahead. So wait, you're from Germany. Mm -hmm. You're in Kansas City to work mm -hmm. with German companies. Mm -hmm. It Swear. works. Okay. Mike, barbecue. Barbecue. Uh, bar bar Remember. That's right. I'm sorry. Stay focused. We're good. We're good. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to digest and put the pictures together in my head. It, it, it is difficult. I, I agree. But barbecue was like here and travel, even in Corona times, was like here. And then I was like, barbecue. Barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Q I want to make a. Yeah. Go for it. Real quick point back about the. Um, the network, right? So your example is taking one check for the network and then fetching these, you know, a large amount or a small amount. But the awesome thing is with it being at the stream, right? Is that if we didn't do the first, we could say, hey, our application could identify when you've switched networks. So if, you, if they're on a mobile device and they walk out and they, they go off their Wi-Fi to a, a wireless network, right? Whatever, then we can have our app adjust accordingly. Um, Absolutely. By simply tapping in here and, and listening and then doing our observable thing. So for like um, offline use cases, this is best. It's a very good way to implement it. Best way might be a little bit exaggerating, but it's a very good way to handle this in a reactive approach to say like, okay, if online, do this. If not online, do everything nice and easy. And I think the amazing thing about it is like, because we're in this observable world, what we're doing is we're reacting. We're just saying, connect to this thing and then just listen. And if it tells me it updated, then I'll have my code run, right? And from that sure. mental model and implementation, it feels real smooth, yeah. True, if you have that mental model established. <laughs> That's true, <laughs> you gotta get it. yeah, right, for sure. <laughs> Which is honestly like the most difficult part about RxJS. Like all these operators are, you can learn about them and check them out when you need them, but like establishing this model is, trips me sometimes. OK, back to web APIs. I, I'm actually ending my presentation shortly. Um, I quickly want to talk about the APIs that are currently supported and that I want to go live with in the first version. So we have everything, at least what I saw, that has the suffix observer, because I still consider that the most reactive APIs provided by the web APIs. We have speech recognition and speech synthesis. Is that correctly pronounced? Syn synthesis? Synthesis. It's not an, I mean, I can't even, so yeah. I mean, I think you're- OK, so it's speech something something, this weird word that I'm not able to pronounce. <laughs> um, we have Bluetooth support. There's a pull request open right now, um, but this will be merged soon. We have 
um, the import API, which is actually really cool to dynamically load, for example, polyfills if an API is not supported uh, at runtime. We have media query lists so that you could, in a reactive approach, implement a dark mode. Network API is shown, position API is shown, permission um, is used by uh, permission is used by position, for example. So this can be used to guess this or to request this prompt from the browser, like, do you want to grant permission or not? Uh, and we have sensor API, which is actually the most difficult uh, or was the most difficult. And I would still be interested to see if this API design is better than the actual sensor API, which I think it is. <laughs> um, but you can use that when you are doing IoT stuff, for example, where you're um, having sensors laying around like or accelerate sensors of your device and stuff like that. Um, pretty cool. Web workers are technically can be written with observables too. I, I'm not 100% sure if web workers are defined in a, uh, what VG standard or whatever, or if they are part of ECMAScript. I'm not 100% sure, but um, even though they are not part of RxS core yet, I didn't want to move them in this library because there's already a library for that that does it so well. Um, and there has to be, they have put a lot of effort in this. They support so much feature that I didn't even thought about. Like, for example, a worker pool strategy where I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> um, so if you want to use web workers with this, I want to give a quick shout out to that because that's amazing. And I already teased it. So the only thing that is technically missing for re releasing a stable version of RxS web is tests. And I hate writing tests. It's, it's really painful. So particular because I kind of want to use Jest, but Jest is using JSTorm, which is even worse for web APIs. And it's like, Fuck. <laughs> well, you, you, it's open source, right? This, uh, I, I, RxJS web? Yeah, it is. I appreciate any any okay. contribution. I would really go. appreciate it. All right, well, let's, let's end the show here. And everybody go out and write a test. Pick, if, pick if, a second, write a test and we'll call it. Technically, if every uh, one that watches that show writes a test, then I can probably release it tomorrow. So I would appreciate it. <laughs> I just one test seems, it, seems pretty straightforward. Right, right. Um, Wait, are we doing marble marble testing with this? Um, so far, I don't use marble testing, even though in the long run I should. Um, so for custom operators, marble testing are amazing from my point of view. So far, I'm still on a level like okay, simulate that the mutation observer trigger, and then so I'm like subscribing and checking how it's behaving. We recently had a conversation with uh, Shai Resnick, and he thinks we should throw marble tests completely out the window. So I think so. <laughs> so Just for, in space. For a business application, I completely agree with Shai here. I think they're way too complex and unnecessary for a business application. Mike, I think they just need to learn the bag of marbles thing. And yeah. then maybe they all set. <laughs> I think I think he has uh, a Jasmine Auto Spy, and um, there was one other thing that he's written to essentially simplify because he was trying to teach marble testing, and you know, like when you teach something, that's when you like realize this is not an easy concept. Like this is not easy to like break down and digest for beginners. And so he literally got to this point where he was like, marble tests were so hard to break down that I, I I started to question why we're using them. And so I wrote something else. So that was <laughs> bag of marbles. I, I are. that it slipped my mind, Justin. But yes, bag of marbles really unlocked that one on our stream that night. They are we were really doing cool if you don't have like zone JS or something like that because it simulates timing and stuff like that. So for that it's really cool for but this is mostly a problem in other libraries. Yes. Um, to be clear, just a quick recap, because we're talking about something that we didn't explain with bag of marbles, is the parentheses in marble diagrams to represent multiple things happen at the same frame. Mm -hmm. um, that 
isn't normally an issue as your test and observables, but if you use of, then it comes on the same frame. If I remember correctly, wasn't it of? I think, that, yeah, I think it's one of those challenging things where you're like, oh man, marble testing is tough, right? When so kind of refer to that because we hit one spot where I was like, what? Do, how do we even describe this or what's going on? And once you learn those things, then I guess it's not so bad. <laughs> we did an exploratory stream of marble testing. I see. I'm still kind of hung up by the part with off. So off is completely synchronous. So it should emit right. everything in one frame and then it complete the meal. It, yes, it'll give you the value and the completion on the same frame. So you uh -huh. have to have the, the parentheses around uh -huh. those two to do that, which we didn't know about. Which oh, we, OK, I see. Which is where the expression, a bag of marbles. <laughs> oh, OK, I, I see. Yeah. Also, what is four hours to uh, kill, and you want to watch a like, stream where we struggle through this? It's on the like YouTube channel. Four hours. You really got to, we got to make a snippet of the, you know, that aha moment. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Justin and I get it under weird detours, and you have to take, you have to take whole, the detours. Yeah. Whole journey. Yes. <laughs> so at, about, at about 0.5 speed on YouTube. So make it eight hours. <laughs> Did you also stumble Very across this weirdness that, like, when you say delay 10, that you have to wait like nine frames and then on the 10th, there's the emission? So that's like, it's saying nine, but that's saying 10 there. It's like, what? What? Yeah. What? I think that that's the challenge is the writing of the, the string that represents the, the stream. And yeah. Like, figuring out the little nuances there. Initially, it feels like pretty clear. And then it, as you get into more details, so you're more complex of your observables, <laughs> then you're like, wait, wait, how do I, how do I describe that in this string? Um, yeah. And once you, I think once you get there, I, I could see it like if you were living in that constantly and constantly writing a lot of marble tests, then I think you, know, you could get in that groove. But True. leaving it for like three months and then coming back and having to look at those, it is, does get challenging to like, what's going on here? But yeah, it's terrible. We've, we've taken yeah. another detour. <laughs> nice i i would definitely watch that i i never use model diagrams and i probably will never just because i hate it but just like anything they they have the right place so absolutely Ab absolutely so i think this the test coverage that we have with rhs couldn't be provided without model diagrams Agreed. like the quality we provide is heavily baked by model diagrams yeah. and Google <laughs> with Google G3. So do you have more slides? I thought I saw you sneak ahead. To I, I'm like, I have like two slides and I just like to use this moment to thank the contributors who did the stuff that I didn't want to do. Um, so give them an applause somewhere, say how nice they are and they are all really nice. So um, I definitely appreciate their support there. And I think this is actually my last or for one of my last slides, I'm super prepared. So one question that I always got like is, okay, you're a part of the RxS core team and you're making this library. Why is that not part of RxS core? And if you have looked at RxS, we already have like a bazillion of operators and we rather try to shrink the API surface just because it is already that big. So what we usually also recommend when people approach us like, what about this new use case operator that would be super nice for me? Um, we usually recommend first implementing something in a third party library, and then depending on the usage, we consider moving it in the RHS core. What is definitely on the to-do list is like that main, uh, libraries by the maintainers uh, might move in a mono repository as soon as we have a mono repository. We just wanted to do this for years. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a, um, pretty much the reason we try to limit API surfaces. And the other reason is RxJS is uh, working entirely in Node.js. If you take the Ajax module out of the scope, and this just uh, existed for an eternity. Um, and RxS web would definitely not work in a Node.js environment and will never work there. 
And I think that makes sense. And the reasonings for keeping it separate also make sense. Uh, that potentially arises a different scenario uh, in terms of version compatibility. Is our is it strategy similar to what Angular has done with keeping major versions in sync with each other, or does it just I, work with any version? Or so I'm predicting that it um, should right now work with version seven. I will probably just go with version one represents RxJS six, version two represents RxJS seven. Um, Maybe I also just go to seven or six. That would probably be more intuitive. Um, I will definitely not make every minor step with just because our, that's unnecessary. There, um, that we won't face any breaking changes. Um, we will probably would probably with version eight uh, when from promise. No, from promise still exists. Yeah. It either exists or it's deprecated, if I remember correctly. I think from prom, prom or is it two promise? Two promise is deprecated. I'm not using two promise, so I'm right now. I can't imagine anything that shouldn't work in the long run. Um, yeah, honestly, nothing I thought about yet. To be fair, <laughs> <laughs> but that's. All I got, and I'm super excited to chat more about it. If there are any questions or ideas, I also appreciate any like, oh yeah, I ha I'm using this web API a lot. That would be cool too. Uh, stuff like that would be super interesting for me. But that's all I got. I got a couple questions. Go for it. Okay, well, first one from Chaos Monster in our He's, oh, chat. Uh, asking, He's still owing me a talk. Go ahead. Just to have that life now. <laughs> well, yeah, we can add him to the list here. He owes us, us one as well. Come back again. Um, so the, the question being about uh, when you talk about the permission, mm -hmm. right? And so we stream and, and try and get a hold of some access to the location, mm -hmm. and the browser is going to prompt and say, "Hey, I need the user's permission." How mm -hmm. does that work in the stream? Uh, you will get an error permission, uh, an error emission if the user clicks on block, and you will get a next notification if the user clicks on grant access or uh, I think allow for this usage or something like that. These are at least the three options that Chrome provide. Um, in the meantime, there is the pending state. Um, this is right now, if I remember the implementation, not forwarded. So right now we pretty much keep a hold on the observable at that point of time when the observable is pending. Um, so, so if I have from location, I think mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about, right? From location. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I subscribe to it, mm -hmm. then it'll kick off. And then if the browser says, blah, 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 I need your permission, that observable, nothing's coming through that yet to my point where I need it until yep. they confirm there. And then when they do, you're saying we get one of those two things through yeah. our stream I at that point. I think the now that I think about it, the from permission actually just emits what's there. So if you say from permission, I want to act grant access or I want to get access to this and that API, um, then you will get whatever it is in from position. I've wrapped that that it will just emits the geolocation as soon as the user granted access to that API. I think that's the current behavior I implemented because that's what I consider like usable. When you're saying, okay, I just want to get the location, you're not really interested in what's the status of the permission. But if you're saying, okay, I want to actively request a certain permission, then you want to know, okay, is it pending? Is it uh, success? Is it did it error or whatever? So that'd be something that we'd want to think about in terms of our architecture of when we use it, of when, as soon as we subscribe to that stream, that's really when the potential is that the user gets prompted. Yes. So think yes. about it, maybe like, do we want to, as our application loads, do the permission one so we can front load, request them and, and get access. And then we could ask for location later without having to worry about that. But if we subscribe Absolutely. to the location, haven't got the permission yet, we got to understand that the minute that we subscribe to that, that they may get prompted at that point yeah. and have to do that. Yeah. Okay. And and that's cool. actually also what I wanted because when you would just use the promise API as soon as you 
do call that API, it's eager. So it would already request a permission, even though you're not using that. Um, therefore, that's what I meant in the beginning with like everything is observ behaving like an observable. As soon as you subscribe, it's doing something. If you don't subscribe, it's doing nothing. I think that's a great point, right? And, and maybe say like, why would we want to use this observable wrapper over the web API? And that's the ability to write the code that says, here's the behavior I want, the observable and the operators. And then I'm, I'm going to write that in one spot, test it, confirm it maybe or whatever. And then I can conditionally call it, conditionally subscribe to it wherever I need to, you know, at that point. Uh, where, like where you're just saying, if it was promised, then you're kind of onto it right away. Sure. Cool. Thank you. So another, another question, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of running in and outside of the zone and performance, right? So like if we have something that we want to tap in and, and listen to this, the mm -hmm. native web APIs, but we want to run that outside of Angular zone because we don't want to have it, you know, doing the whole change detection thing mm -hmm. and everything as a result of things flowing through that. Are we able to just do that by, you know, wrapping that uh, in the outside of zone or how's that play? Yeah, that was uh, so. What I would recommend actually, there is a library out there which is pretty much a zone scheduler for our, uh, for Angular. So in this way, you can say like, okay, either subscribe on or observe on zone scheduler or outside zone scheduler. So I'm right now using that a lot for a use case where I have like a Cordova app that works with. NGRX and NGRX has those runtime check runtime check to see if you dispatch an action inside the ng zone, and then I just use that. Or um, yeah, then I can, for example, if I'm in my effect dispatching the action in the end, I can then just use observe on zone scheduler or something like that, and then I'm good to go. It's that's what I would recommend there. There's no built-in mechanism in RxJS web for figuring out whether you're in zone, because then it would be an additional dependency already. But we do have that solution that we can yes. build on our side, right? Cool. Cool. Those are the two questions that, well, one question I had and one question that Chaos Monster had. So thank you. That was cool. That was were a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, so there's a, more generic RxJS question in the chat that is not necessarily tied to RxJS web, but more so the idea of the difficulties and challenges of learning RxJS uh, seem to be yeah. hard, uh, especially for a lot of developers who may decide to fall back to other ways of managing asynchronous things like promises mm -hmm. or callbacks. Uh, do you have any advice or what have you for people who are seeking to learn to overcome the challenges of getting their minds around it. So, and, and also um, potentially seeing the value of it as well. Yeah, th this is like the first thing from my point of view. Like, you have to um, consider for yourself do you think RxJS is valuable or not? And there's definitely this trade off of, of cancellation, uh, convenient API, uh, unified interface, and stuff like that. On the other hand, you have this uh, steep learning curve, which is, which is tough. I, don't want to talk this down. And honestly, the best approach I figured out, and that's also how I learned it in the end, was just to build whatever stuff with it as much as possible. Um, so the problem is that the difficulty about RxJS is not all the operators, how observables behave and stuff like that. But the difficulty is to change the way of thinking about how program flow should work. When you're coming from, it doesn't matter if you're coming from function programming or object-oriented programming. It's always this very strict, like, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And now when you're having a reactive approach where you're saying, like, OK, I want in certain conditions to react to something, this is pretty much like thinking the other way around, like, OK, this has to happen so that I do this. And as soon as you have this understanding, then you can start like think, uh, learning more about RxS, like, Oh, yeah, OK, an observable is cold, so that's why it's behaving like that. But these are then just like nuances where you can, where you then can consult the docs, which is good, like, OK, I'm using this weird operator. How is it behaving? If you have that knowledge already, then you can understand it. If you just go to the docs, they won't help you, which is 
part a problem of the docs, to be fair. They should be better in that regard. Um, but my recommendation was always build whatever stuff. And like particularly event-oriented stuff is really good for IHS, like type ahead, drag and drop, carousels, like slideshow thingies, all that stuff that have user event kind of interaction are really good with RxJS. And you will see, um, particularly if you uh, implement both, that you will, you will notice that like, okay, I have 20 lines of RxJS code while I have 60 lines of at event listeners. Um, I'm not saying it's easier to read when you don't have RxJS knowledge, but it's less code. I think your point about the mind shift and kind of getting into that is is a good point too. I think that like a, one of the things I think of is if we talk about working with like a socket connection, right? And let's say you're regularly reprogramming stuff and you're you're just doing inline, you know, walking through your code, and then you go and add a socket connection. What happens there, right? We're we're opening the door for something else to tell your code at a, at any given time, right? And then you kind of start mapping that mentally to, well, that's kind of what we're talking about with reactive is we're saying we're opening the door for something else to tell us, hey, do something. And we don't know when it might happen, right? Um, but we're writing code to support that, you know, something else calling it. WebSockets are actually a really good example as they also show um, pretty much the two characteristics that you just said, like, okay, other call us, but also we don't know about the amount or like how often they are calling us. and. As soon as you understand like those key characteristics, then it's like, then you can move forward. Yeah, I think that there's been a lot of really good RxJS related conference talks. And to your mm -hmm. point, I would love to see a conference talk that is purely 20, 25, 30, 45 minutes. That is just how to think reactively. Because a lot of people are like, Rx is great. You just have to think reactively. Here's some operators. And rather yeah. than taking that detour to talk about operators immediately, is to dive deeper into the idea of thinking reactively, how to get your mind around that in given um, different examples of where are good points to be able to think reactively and how it can improve uh, your code. Yeah. yeah. The, the and, good thing- know, Val, he okay. asked- Oh, sorry. Uh, Val was just asking specifically like why why are de like because well, he is like 200 developers that he sees statistics from and like 70 percent of those just see rxjs and then they turn away from it and just go back to promises or callbacks even and so i feel like the why it there's a lot of reasons why but i think one could be that you have to be on the yeah. other side of it to see the value and if you, if you haven't got to that point where you can see the value, why why would I take the time to learn how to think reactively? Why like it's it is a steep learning curve, and that's time and like mental brain effort as a developer that you have to put into that. And if you don't yeah. see the value, it's just I don't know. It's and there's you know I always look at development as this like spectrum, like a gauge, and on one side of the gauge is UI and design, and on the other side. Uh, is like server and DevOps and and there's everything in between, right? And I feel like uh, we only have so much time and energy that we as developers can put into the community and can put into our our array on that gauge. And um, I feel like the wider spread you are, like the harder it is for you to be good at that, like at every single thing on there. And so um, for me, it's just uh, like I'm one of those 70% that was like, this is so hard. And it's not really in that like wedge that I really want to like be good at. And so um, I don't know. I I hope I hope there's it gets easier and that that mountain can be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a good answer. But why? I'll, I'm on that seventy percent, and I can tell you, it's too hard. I don't see the value. So there's part of things when you're learning something new that as you go up, there are challenges with learning something new, and to cross over that point, you end up with a decision point of, do I keep going? Am I going to make it to that summit to get over that learning point? Or am I going to fall back down into my comfort blanket and say, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I like this. I'm going to stay with my promises and callbacks. And yeah. I, and that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. But th there Listen, is the and the and promise that's gets me the data. I have the data. Leave me and the data <laughs> alone. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but you either get over that hurdle or you don't. Not that you, your code won't work. Not that you can't accomplish a task, but there's different ways to think about it and different techniques to learn. And 
if you get to that point, great. I think that's great. I, I'm happy when I had my RxJS aha moment. But um, if you don't get there, yeah, that, that aha moment is really huge. And the, the thing is, is that it's not just one. There's multiple uh, aha moments. Hi, kiddo. Uh, and you can wave hi. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, but there's multiple aha moments. So to be able to cross over that learning path or hump to get there and say, all right, I've hit my aha moment. I want to keep pushing forward or I'm struggling to get to that point and falling back to what you know. The, the interesting part about that particular is that you have this aha moment and then you might face a different one where you think where you reconsider your first aha moment, but afterwards it's pretty flat. There's so honestly, so if you had that aha moment, then you can look at operators and be like, yeah, okay, that makes sense why it's working like that. If you didn't have that aha moment, you're just like, okay, I have to use it. I don't know why. Um, and there's so for Angular, for example, you have you have like a steady learning curve. There's always more to explore. There's like um so I still don't understand zone, for example. I should still get more into schematics and stuff like that. Um, there's always more to explode for RxJS. For sure, you could look at the 105th operators, even though you're never going to use it. Um, but once you had this aha moment, afterwards, it's going to be better, much better, <laughs> even though there might be multiples. I have totally to agree to that. I had multiple aha moments, too. <laughs> And, and I think that's why a lot of initial demos when RxJS was gaining in popularity a few years ago was the type ahead um, to talk about, all right, how do I think about this? Not so much about the operators, but if you think about what it's actually doing and the amount of code that it takes to write it without RxJS and the amount of code it takes to write with RxJS kind of paints two very different pictures. Um, yeah. But I think the ideas behind it can be explored a little bit more as well. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, the good thing is the RxJS content that's out there, at least from in terms of like um, conference talks and that is pretty good just because those people that do conference talk are really passionate about it and had those aha moments and everything. On the other side, there is this lack of getting someone to the same point. Where... Do you ever reminisce about your aha moments? Like think about them in the past and want to relive them. Like, you know, I had this awesome pulled pork sandwich on this ciabatta bread that was amazing. And, and I remember the day I had it, but like in terms of the code, like I, I totally recall having this aha moment with RxJS, but I don't know if I remember it as much detail and want to revisit it again. I, I just on to the do, next one. And it, and it was actually know. a conference talk at, at ng-conf, I believe it was, by... His name's escaping me right now. Firebase, David. Yeah, East. David East. East. I, I, there it is. It came to me. Um, he started off his conference talk. He goes, "When I started getting into thinking about observables, I started to see observables anywhere." And he mentioned this idea. He looked at his dog, and he saw an observable of barks. And I was like, "Holy crap! This isn't just for data coming back from the API. Oh this is so everything. Funny. It's everywhere." <laughs> And to, he had that slide slide with a dog doing like the Zen thing, right? <laughs> yes, I think I remember that. Um, but I just I, that's what I always remember. And yeah, to have those signature moments, it's almost like going, going up playing Tony Hawk, uh, and then going out for a walk or driving around. You're like, oh, I could totally grind off of that, or I could totally do that move too. Again, David <laughs> Easton skateboarding too, right? Uh, <laughs> But to see those things where you take one idea and you apply it elsewhere, I think that's also a statement of moving from learning to understanding that you're taking what you've learned and apply it elsewhere. Yeah. Very true. Very true. All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour, so got to wrap it up. Um, let's do some picks real quick if anybody has any picks, and then we'll uh, call it a show. First, our panelists. Do our panelists have anything they want to mention? Today. Well, to something just happened today. maybe yesterday. Today, uh, yeah, yesterday V11 dropped woot of Angular, and uh, today at 12 p.m. PST, there is going to be the first time ever an Angular update party, and so you can join the Angular Discord. It's open to everybody. 
Um, and they'll do a keynote on the Angular YouTube and a Q&A to the Angular team. So you want to be on the Angular YouTube and in the Discord, kind of bounce back and forth. Um, and then about 30 minutes after that, uh, they asked some GDEs to host some game sessions. And so I volunteered. So on the Kendo UI YouTube channel at 12.30 PST, me and Justin are going to be hosting a game session and probably just commentating on what's going down with, uh, you know, the update party and just having some fun. I'll be giving away some prizes. So uh, two, two places, the Angular YouTube channel and the Kendo UI YouTube channel. Nice. Nice. Looking forward to that. Mike, you got any picks today? I want to pick, but I don't. I do. I will. Um, this week, uh, not only was there a release of Angular, but new gaming hardware. Uh, two new consoles launched this week. So outside, get outside of programming, do some other things. What, what consoles? What, what are you talking about? There's a new Xbox and a new PlayStation that were Oh, released. right. Yeah, yeah. I thought you meant like their were two new consoles like competing with Xbox and PlayStation. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I got you. I'm with you. It's Xbox and PlayStation. <laughs> no. uh, but yeah, explore things outside of programming. Take a break. Get outside. Do fun things. Nice. Nice. Well, my pick was going to be Mike's new Xbox because now he performs a lot better when we play together. So I'm 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 appreciative of him getting a, the new Xbox. So, yeah. All right, John, do you have any picks or anything you want to mention today? So to kind of hook into that, if you have a PlayStation, I would recommend Demon Souls just because classic Dark Souls vibes. Um, I I knew this. Picks are going to come, and I completely forgot about it then. So no, that, I'm that's a good one. Improving. Yeah. Okay, I go with Demon Souls. I like Demon there Souls. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Beautiful. I also want to shout out to the chat. Thanks for chiming in today. It was some good conversation. So thank you for more. that. Okay. Can I have one more. Sure. Uh, next week is uh, Enterprise NG. Uh, there's mm -hmm. definitely some free aspects of that. Oh my there gosh! Are... How did I? <laughs> How did I forget that? Wow. Right. Um, I, I kind of get upset with myself. I didn't mention that being that I work with Frosty <laughs> and Joe, uh, but yeah, enterprise NG, I know there's definitely free aspects of it. Uh, so go and check that out. Yeah. Well. Monday, I'm actually doing a Kendo UI workshop. That's free. So there's also a quality RxS course that I reviewed. So I know it's good. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what we're saying. Awesome. <laughs> Well, hey, John, uh, thanks a ton for coming back on the show, sharing your time, sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate it. We're looking forward to checking out RxJS web for sure. So thank you very much. It was lovely. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> for sure. Looking forward to the next time you're back. Yeah, sounds great. Nice. Awesome. All right, that's a wrap, everyone. Take it easy. See you next time. Later. <laughs>